Um, thank you for joining our webinar today called How It's Made, Glass Objects at Falling Water and a live demo at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. I'm Ashley Andrakovich. I'm Curator of Education at Falling Water. And I'm here to introduce today's presenters. Um, first, we have Rebecca Hagen, who is the Registrar at Falling Water, where she oversees the care and documentation of the museum collection and archive. We also have Jason Fork from the Pittsburgh Glass Center. He is a Pittsburgh-based glass artist working, uh, I already said, primarily in glass. He currently works as a creative projects director at Pittsburgh Glass Center, where he designs functional tableware, as well as custom lighting for architectural projects. We also are, jo are joined by Valerie Bundy, who is director of education at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. And you'll see another person in the studio with Jason, that is Chris Ross, uh, assisting him there. Um, so I'm pleased to turn it over to Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Falling Water. Uh, the Kaufmans, of course, commissioned Falling Water from Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and so he designed our country home here in Mill Run, Pennsylvania, not too far from Pittsburgh, and our friends at the Glass Center. Um, he did complete the main house in 1937 and the guest house in 1939. Um, so the Kaufmans were quickly moving into the house. They they weren't, um, they weren't waiting. They were so excited to get in that they moved in, in December of 1937. And we'll see some early photographs from our archival collection um, that show that early time period. But they did start decorating the house, of course, with their own materials. So they're drawing from their interest in furniture and decorative arts, whether from the department store or just their personal um, interests or hobbies. And they're acquiring art from local artists, artists abroad, um, it's just a diverse mix of backgrounds and they were purchasing the, either them from the artists themselves or from galleries or antique shops, again, both here in the United States or abroad. Um, and our collection, because of that, represents a really diverse mix of cultures and time periods, media, um, and again, represent the tastes of each individual uh, Kaufman family member. They were all bringing objects into the house here. In this photo, you can see a few different glass pieces, which we're going to get into a few of the sort of highlights of uh, the different mix we have here. But here you can see uh, glass from Tiffany, Kai Franck, and other unknown artists in this sort of west seating area in the living room. Uh, but they do have um, a very diverse collection of glass. Again, coming from around the world, we have pieces from Mexico, Finland, uh, France, Italy, and beyond, and of course, you know, United States. So before I hand it over to our friends at the um, Pittsburgh Glass Center, I will highlight a few pieces from our collection. These stacking glasses were by a Finnish designer, Sarah Hopia, and uh, we have many different sizes. They range from a very small sort of shot glass style up into a larger juice style um, stacking glass in a variety of colors as well. And they are now displayed um, next to the bedsides in the house, next to an American thermos bottle company pitcher. And you can see here, the glass is actually being used at Falling Water on the West Terrace in this great 1957 photo. And on the left is Edgar Kaufman Jr. On the, um, directly to his left, our right is Paul Mayenne, his partner. And then seated is Paul's sister, Flores Rodosi, and her husband, who is also an artist, um, Albert Rodosi. And we also have some local pieces. So uh, Western Pennsylvania is really known for its glass production. We have many different workshops here in the region. And this piece specifically came from Westmoreland Glass, which is out of Grapeville, Pennsylvania. And that's just about a 45 minute drive for us today. Uh, so pretty close to falling water. And they were famous for their milk glass. And they were at one point actually the number one producer of high quality milk glass in the United States. And so here in our master bedroom, or sorry, master bath, um, there are several pieces of milk glass, but this great little lion soap dish uh, by the sink, which is one of my favorite sort of cute little pieces, is produced locally. Um, 
And again, it, as in the master bath of the house there. Great. Um, to sort of show you a different um, piece, let me pull it up. Uh, we have several pieces from Mexico in our collection. The Kaufman family were frequent visitors to Mexico in the 1930s and the 1940s. Uh, this piece though specifically came from the Kaufman department store when they had a Below the Rio Grande exhibition in 1940. So in all likelihood, this piece didn't sell like a few others that we know were part of the exhibition. Um, and they ultimately ended up at Falling Water. So we're, we presume that they, they brought them home from the exhibition if they didn't sell. Uh, but you can see in this really early photo of Falling Water, we don't have the coffee tables yet by right. Um, so probably 1939, 1940, that these uh, Mexican decanters were used uh, along with a Russell Wright ice bucket and with some glasses. Uh, so clearly they're enjoying their space. Um, but the imagery of course on the bottle is um, taken from what we recognize from the Mexican flag. But that is based on the Aztec legend where a God told this nomadic trab to settle where they saw an eagle perched on the cactus eating a snake. Um, and that of course established the city of Tenochtitlan which eventually became uh, Mexico City in the present day. So this, this photo again is, is showing these uh, Mexican pieces in the living room. They were later used uh, based on historic evidence from our archive in the dining area. And they are now in the master bath, with those other milk glass pieces from our collection. We also have pieces by um, French glass designer, Rene Lalique in that master bath. He is known for his art glass jewelry, bottles and vases. We have three pieces in our collection, two of which are in this master bath space in which you can see in this uh, sort of great nighttime view in the corner window of the bathroom. Um, this, this space is on a shelf. And this is a froster, frosted satyr art glass space. And um, the other piece we have in there is a perfume case. And of course, we have a lot of Tiffany here. Uh, we have about 20 pieces, well, over 20 pieces in our collection. It is our largest collection of glass from one artist or designer. Um, of course, Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Um, we have a piece by him in just about every room of the house, but this one kind of get over, gets overlooked, so I thought I'd mention it today. This is in the living room on the partner's desk. It's a bowl with a lily pad pattern. Um, it is missing a frog. Uh, a flower frog insert that would have gone in that, that center section. Um, and we do know that that insert was missing before it came to Falling Water based on, again, historic photographic evidence from our archive. But Tiffany is famous for creating Favreau glass, which um, you do see in this object here. It's a technique that incorporated color within the glass pieces at the molten phase. So it produces a really rich iridescent quality. And you can see on this, um, photo of the back where the the maker's mark is that it again is really iridescent and even in the the lower photograph on the lily pads and Alvar Alto he designed a vase um, that we use at Falling Water that is used in actually multiple places in the house, but it is one of my favorite pieces in the collection, specifically because of how it's made. And we'll learn a little bit more about that process of using a wood mold from Jason later. But Alvaro Alto was a Finnish designer and he created this Savoy vase in 1936 for a competition to be on the Swedish pavilion at the 1937 Paris uh, World Fair. And he did win that competition. Uh, this organic shape that you see on the left next to this mold is made by mouth blowing heated glass, which has been inserted into that wood form. And originally the wood form would have been allowed to slowly burn away each time they made a vase. But today um, where it's still made, they actually uh, remove it and paste it in a annealing kiln, which allows the glass to very slowly cool down to, um, to reduce chances of cracking or other damage. So it's just kind of a more sustainable practice today, but it takes seven glass blowers, 12 work stages and 30 hours to complete just one of these vases. Um, every single vase is unique 
And again, no two are the same. So it's a really special piece. Uh, I wanted to include this photo of Elvar Alto and his wife, Ina, at Falling Water here on the East Terrace back in um, around 1939, that is from our archive. And this again would have been shortly after the Kaufmans moved into the house um, that the couple visited. But this vase grew in popularity very quickly and again is still manufactured today by Itala. Um, and you can purchase it in our museum store, both online and in store. And the last artist I wanted to touch on is Timo Serpeneva, who is another Finnish designer. He is best known for his glass work and he really liked to incorporate form and function in his pieces. It's a lot of utilitarian pieces. Um, we have several pieces from him in our collection, both on display and in storage. The one on the left was only recently attributed to Serpeneva and it's a, a small sun ball, which was produced by Itala in 1960s and is unmarked. So that is why we, for a long time, didn't know who the, mark, uh, the maker was. On the right is one of a set of six plates in our collection. They are currently in storage. Uh, on the rim is etched Timo Serpeneva, 1950, uh, 1959. And uh, this plate is one of the inspiration for uh, today's live demo by Jason over at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. So just a few pieces from our very diverse collection and I wanna hand it over so we can see this live demo of how these things are actually made, which is so fascinating. So thank you so much for joining us. I'll hand it over to you, Valerie, at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear me, Rebecca? Yes, I can. Hi everyone, I'm Valerie, uh, the program director here at Pittsburgh Glass Center, and we're excited to welcome you right into the hot shop. Uh, Pittsburgh Glass Center is an open access education facility, state-of-the-art glass studios, and as well as a gallery. We're located in the Garfield neighborhood of Pittsburgh, right on Penn Avenue. We really are excited to welcome everyone of every level to take a workshop or a class with us. Uh, come explore our gallery or purchase local glass artwork or from our own collection that we sell here called our Penn Fairmont line. We're really excited to be here with you today with our friends at Falling Water to connect their awesome collection with the work that we do here every day. And with that, um, we'll be taking some questions. If you want to add them in the chat, we can talk, we'll take questions at the end. Um, we also will talk to you at the end a little bit about how you might be able to purchase the, the piece that Jason is going to make today. So with that, I'm really excited to turn it over to glass artist extraordinaire and our creative program director, Jason Schwartz, as well as his assistant, Chris Rock, here in the studio. Okay. Thanks, everybody, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you. My name is Jason Schwartz. This is Chris Ross. He's going to be assisting me on this demo. Um, Thanks, Rebecca and Ashley. Uh, Rebecca, that was a really cool look at some of the objects in the collection. Um, so as, as Rebecca mentioned, we're going to uh, do a few pieces that are inspired by um, the Finnish designers, mainly Sarpaneva and Alto. So um, we're going to start with a kind of a large oversized platter, like table platter that would um, be kind of have some of the color fade that we see on that um the plate or the dinner plate chris do you want to pick up the alabaster so to kind of give this a little more maybe structure is not the right word but a little more weight and less uh transparency we're gonna use uh, a couple of colors one will be an alabaster glass uh, and i have this chunk um so what chris is going to do is pick up a little piece of of this glass that's been preheated and we're gonna drop that over the top of a clear bubble. So when we blow the bubble out, this alabaster is gonna go with it. So Chris just took a gather of clear glass that he's kind of shaping up. Chris, watch out for that cord on your way over to the kiln. So just a quick shape up and now he's going to pick up a small chunk of this that's sitting at about oh, 1050 degrees in one of our kilns back behind the camera there. And then we have another color already picked up so it doesn't, we don't have to go through the process uh, two times, but um, Chris is coming over 
now you'll be able to get a look. So just a small piece of alabaster and this color, particular color is really stiff and fairly dense. So we don't need a whole lot of it, especially for the kind of color application we're trying to do today. So what he's doing now is he's heating it up in a oven that is at about 2300 degrees. That's a reheating chamber. So you'll see us spend most of the time kind of in this area, heating and uh, working on the glass. So what I have is a stainless steel tube. We call this the blowpipe. Um, there's a mouthpiece on this end. The other end is red hot so that when I go into that furnace, the glass will actually stick to it. So that's where I'm gonna head next. Um, so this is what we call the furnace over here. So inside here, it's 2,125 degrees. Um, and it's sort of a big tub of glass in there. So. I just lower this rod in, find the level of the glass. I'm rotating as I'm coming out. And that's what we call a gather. So I have to keep this rotating. If I stop turning, that glass is going to drip right to the floor. So I keep turning. And because of the kind of distance I have to, the pipe has to travel down into that furnace. For me to comfortably hold this, I need to cool it down. So we just have a station there for cooling that pipe. And now I'm gonna go over and start to shape this bubble up. So I'm using a steel table, we call it the Marver. Um, a lot of the terms are used that we use are from, you know, old French, Roman, uh, Italian kind of terms. So this is, from my understanding, the, the word for marble. At one point, these would have been a marble slab. So I'm going to start a small bubble in this glass by trapping air here. So my thumb has trapped air inside this pipe. Um, the only place for it to go is going to be out through that in, so we should start to see a bubble emerging out there. And that's kind of the way our process generally starts. So now what we're doing is I'm gonna be waiting for Chris to heat up this alabaster that we are going to drop over the top of this. How are you looking, Chris? Yeah, just get it really hot. And I would maybe just a quick touch on the marble and then we'll heat it and drop it. You can get a little deeper too. So one of the interesting things about working with different colors um, of glass is that the the coefficient of expansion varies. So we're looking at this color glass that Chris is working on, it's actually heating up much slower than what our clear glass does. So it's taking a little bit more uh, convincing, I guess, in that reheating chamber to get to the temperature we want it to be at. You good? Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna drop this little bit of color on top of this bubble. Chris is getting that nice and high. Let me come over here a little more. Well, so I just try to find the center of that. Okay, and now I'm going to get this hot and really try to smash that color back over. Chris, you can go ahead and start heating up that other color now. So I mentioned the alabaster. The other color we have is the steel, it's called steel gray. So it's kind of borrowing from that kind of bluish green gray color that the uh, Sarpaneva plates were made out of. 
And so Chris is going to start to heat that color up as I push this one back over my bubble. So you can see I already kind of made a pretty big move there, and now I just have to push that back a bit more. Oh, no. Try to discard it. So I have a pretty limited window to work with the glass anytime that I come out, but especially with a color like alabaster, it really kind of limits the time that I can be outside of that heating chamber. So I'm getting pretty close to having that pushed all the way over my bubble now. Chris is just picking out a few impurities of this other on this other color before we start to shape it to drop it on top. So really a lot of the time that we will spend on making a vessel or in this case a platter will be spent, you know, on this setting up the color pattern ahead of time. So um, this is, you know, not terribly cumbersome. If we were to add, you know, a lot of linear aspects, what we call pain or uh, more decorative kind of coloring techniques, you could really spend, you know, a half hour to a full day just setting up your color pattern um, to get that ready. How you looking? You good? Yep. All right. Let's get it hot and maybe shape it one time and then we'll bring it after that. So typically when you see a glass blowing process uh, like we're doing, we're going to see at least one assistant helping and you'll see several moments during this demonstration where it's really tough to do uh, on your own. So, you know, having a kind of a uh, seasoned or experienced assistant is really necessary for a lot of the process. Um, I know Chris has been working with glass for well over 10 years and I'm at like 20 years. So it's, you know, there's a lot of experience that goes into kind of knowing the language, the technical skills that all are involved in the process. All right, so Chris gave me a little nod, he's ready. We're gonna take this steel gray, drop it over top. And this color um, being a little more darker and more absorbent actually heats up faster than the clear. So it's gonna be a little bit easier for me to push over that bubble. So right now I'm kind of trying to specifically heat up that top color on there. So when I come over, I can really squeeze that back over that whole shape. Just about got it. So one more heat, I should be able to kind of get rid of the seam that we have there. Make sure my bubble's still intact and then start to add some clear glass over the top of this. So despite all of this compression um, and heating that we're doing, we should still have a small bubble inside this mass of glass out here. And 
I'm just kind of working toward the shape that I want so that I can add more glass from the furnace over that. Check to make sure my bubble's in there still. It's like it's puffing out a little bit. So I think we're good to go. We're gonna let this cool for just a second and then we'll head back into the furnace to add more glass to it. So there's really not any way for us to go in and to the furnace and add the entire amount of glass that we want to use with one gather. So many times we're layering and building up those gathers of glass on top of here to, you know, to get to the scale that we want. On a production level, those things are very kind of uh, fine tuned. So there's a guy that all he will do all day is gather the right amount of glass um, for you know an alto base, and he will then hand that glass off to the next guy who's really attuned at blowing it into the mold. And so it's very efficient. Everybody's really good at a very specific job. Um, and on a large production scale, you're able to do that. Um, for us, we're not making you know that many objects a day. So it doesn't really make sense for us to have specific people starting when we're only making a few of some. So I have another gather on there now, clear glass over the top. And what I'm gonna start to do is actually try to squeeze a little bit of this clear off the end to kind of mimic the color density fade of the plate. We're gonna try to do what we call a color blow through. So, I'm going to try to make more of the clear glass go off the end of that bubble. And then, kind of by just the natural way the bubble will blow out, it'll go out through that clear and it'll thin the color out more um, towards the tip of that where all that uh, clear is. And, you know, a ways down the road, we'll see that we should see more of a dense color line around the lip of the plate um, where the center will be a little more translucent. So now I'm gonna start to blow this up a little bit more. I'm just kind of keeping an eye on that. I know that I'm gonna add more glass to this still. So I don't want to thin this out too much. This pad here is just a pad of wet newspaper. So it's kind of the closest we can get our hands to the actual glass. It becomes a little bit more like uh, throwing clutch on the wheel. I'm gonna take one more heat and shape this up a little bit and then we'll be ready to gather some more glass. Up. We'll need that for the next thing. Okay, one more puff. So you can see even you know, a stack of wet newspaper really is going to burn pretty quickly when it's in contact with something that's upwards of around 2000 degrees. But our glass well, I mentioned earlier, we have a very limited window to work with it. But, you know, I went from being able to really push that around with the paper there just a few seconds ago to now, if you can hear that, it's, you know, it sounds a lot like hitting you know, a cup that would be in your cupboard uh, at home. It's very solid, especially on the X here. So, um, you know, kind of because of the exposure the surface area is, it cools down from the exterior in. So while the interior of that is still, you know, really hot, the exterior at least has a shell that is cooled enough to where it'll be able to sustain uh, me going in and adding more 
clear glass over the top of it. So we'll do our last gather now. Okay, so now we have a more substantial amount of glass here. Uh, we said this was, you know, inspired by the Sarpaneva plate. It definitely will not be the same scale as we're going quite a bit larger. I imagine that even after that last gather, that would have been more glass than they needed for the, the dinner plate. So I'm again kind of squeezing the clear glass down. Got quite a bit of movement here. All right, Chris, let's get a quick feed on that, please. Come back to the bench and I'm going to take that from you there. Keep turning, please. Okay, I got it. Okay, so what I have in my mouth now is actually a tube that allows me to blow air into this. As I'm doing now while I'm shaping the glass, controlling the temperature. So we were talking about it beforehand. Unfortunately, I can't talk and blow at the same time, but it does give me a lot of control over the air pressure going in. Um, Perhaps in, you know, in non-COVID times, we would be more apt to having our assistant put air into that for us. Uh, we've kind of tried to not do a, quite as much of that kind of germ spread in the studio. So now I'm using this steel table just as a cooling device to cool the bottom half of this. So I'm gonna shape it again. Okay, Chris, I'll do the jack line next time. I don't know how well you can see, but I can start to see a little transparency at the bottom half of this right now already. So I know that that blow through is working for us. We have more, most of that color density up closer to the pipe. And now what we're gonna be doing is adding a constriction line that will eventually act as a fault line for us to be able to take this piece off of the pipe. So we call that fault line the jack line. Because this pool in my hands now is called the jacks. Hit that again one more time and try to constrict that line down. So I want to make sure that I get a nice constriction with this line. Um, because as I mentioned, we're going to want it to break off fairly cleanly at that spot where I'm kind of telling it to constrict down with that tool. Chris, thank you. Chris was just blocking my hand from a little bit of the heat that comes off off of that. That's also the reason I have this 
kind of thing that looks almost like a sock on my arm here. Uh, it's just to protect my arm from the radiant heat coming off of the glass. So we're pretty close here on our shape. I'm gonna kind of give it a little more air. And then we're actually gonna kind of square the bottom of this off. And what I keep referring to the bottom, but what will be the actual bottom of the plate is what's farthest away from me right now. Okay, go on. So Chris is using a wood paddle, and we're kind of setting up a right angle post slightly off of a right angle to create a flat spot on the bottom of this on again. Okay. So now we have kind of a nice ridge here. I'll bring this over closer to the camera for you to see. And that's going to act as the bottom of our platter. So we kind of work to get a pretty hard edge down here. And so, as you can see, you know, we have kind of an enclosed vessel form here, still very much like a bubble. Uh, and that's what we're about to change now. So we're gonna switch the, the axis of this. So we're kind of, instead of being over here, we're gonna flip this 180 degrees so that I have, um, access to the opening of this vessel that we can start to open up wide into that plate shape. So in order to do that, we need to transfer this piece of glass. So this is a specific moment um, in this emblem process that uh, is very important and also where a lot of um, beginners or people that are learning have a lot of trouble with because we need very specific heats, both out of, you know, the vessel that I have right now on the end of this blowpipe, but also a very specific heat in that little bit of glass that Chris is working on there, which kind of looks like almost like a kind of a pointy Q-tip shape. Yeah, maybe point it up one more time, just a lower level. Yeah, there you go. All right. Let's take a heat. So Chris is going to heat that up uh, and bring it over. And I'm going to try my best to stick that directly in the center of this bottom or the base of this vessel here. So really leaning out. I'm going to touch it lightly so I can kind of move it around still. And again, all I'm doing right now is rotating and trying to find the center of that base there, which it looks like we're pretty close. So now I'm gonna use a bit of water up at that constriction line I made, which is gonna shock the glass. And then when I tap it, the vibration will kind of tell the glass to break right along that fractured line that we put the water on. So now we have successfully transferred um, what was our air passage there that we were blowing up is now kind of the opening of this vessel. So I want to just take a second real quick to make sure that I did indeed get it on center while the, the punting, as we call it, that little bit that Chris brought over is still warm. I can kind of move it around a little. Chris, will you get a uh, bigger sofa, Sophia, please? All right, I think we're looking pretty good here. So now we start to work on the opening of the vessel. Um, since it's not on the blowpipe anymore, I can't really add air pressure through, you know, through this solid rod. So we need a special tool that we call the Sopieta to do that. Now, yeah. 
And so it's just a cone, uh, kind of like a long straw with a cone on the end. So we can create a seal with the round opening here and we can blow into that vessel to kind of add some air that will help kind of thin out the glass that's up at the top so that it's a little more uniform with the rest of the, the piece. So this is a takes a little bit longer to heat take this heat because you know up around that constriction line the glass you know because we wanted it to be rather solid was a little bit cooler so it just takes a little while to heat it back up. Now you can start to see some orange glow back in there. Chris, I'll have you paddle first, please. Okay, on light. That's good. And glow. I don't know if you can see the shape of that changing. Okay, that's good but it puffed up quite a bit there when we did that. So now we're ready to kind of start putting this shape up now. So over the course of a few heats, I'll start to try and get the whole kind of a cylinder shape right now, start to get get it hot all the way back to that base. So, um, you know, kind of naturally, by the way I'm going in there and what's this in there, you can see this end is really glowing. So it's gonna be the thing that wants to heat up the fastest each time I go in there. So I'm just kind of trying to cool that and coax it into getting a little bit wider back behind that lip each time. Chris, would you throw a, um, paddle up on the bench for me. Maybe a longer one for whenever I shape this. Yeah, that would be better. If you need to grab another paddle that's bigger. Oh. So I keep on doing this. It's kind of a, just very touchy at this point. You know, the lip is fairly thin, so. It's really easy to get it too hot to where it wants to collapse, which I don't want to happen on itself. Um, but I'm, I am getting it a little bit lower and wider each time. And also, we'll talk about it a little bit. You'll really see it in action, but uh, centrif centrifugal force is really playing an action. So if I'm turning faster, it's gonna start opening up more naturally on its own, uh, which at a certain point I want, not quite yet. So hopefully you can see with each, with each heat, we're changing shape a little bit. We would kind of have an interesting bowl shape right now if we did go off. Getting a little wider. This may go in the back for me. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get ready, Chris. Oh, uh, I'm gonna have Chris get dressed because we're just about ready now to finish. And we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna really use centrifugal force now to kind of open this up the rest of the way. So, hope you can see well in here because a lot of the work is gonna happen right up here at this hole. Can I get back on this side now? So as I'm rotating, it's getting wider, wider. And 
now for kind of what I want is just a little lift on that lip. I think my power just went off now. You can still hear me? Oh, thank you. All right, and that is pretty much what we want. So Chris has the gloves ready. I'm gonna use a little drop of water down here. And then with the tap of this paddle, we come right off there. So we're gonna take this over to a kiln. This side. So our kiln's sitting at about 920 degrees. And that's a very safe temperature to where the glass isn't gonna, it's not in danger of cracking, but it's also not gonna continue to move or change shape anymore at that point. So that is kind of where all of our pieces go for a, you know, we'll work for a full day, fill up that kiln, and then over 14 to 16 hours, depending on the thickness, it'll slowly cool down to room temperature. So it's always exciting when you have a good day of glass blowing to come in the next day to kind of open the kiln and see how everything turned out. Um, we're gonna do one other quick thing real quick, just clear glass to show you uh, a little bit of the story or how a wood mold would be used uh, for glass blowing. So, we have a, a wood mold over here that is one of the products we make here at the Pittsburgh Glass Center uh, for a line that we call Pin Fairmont. And Pin Fairmont is just kind of a line of uh, tableware, uh, vases, cups, uh, and in this case, a carafe that we, that we do in-house here in a, a number of colors. So I'm gonna gather up some clear glass, again, using a blowpipe, slightly smaller size, Blow pipe, but I still have the end of this is nice and red. I'm trying to take a fairly good sized gather on that to start with. And we will really see the bubble kind of emerge this time. I'm not going to. Be, I'm going to be trying to get it to blow out a bit more than what we were previous. So I'll come over here to the Marver again. Glass is really hot right now. So it's, you know, I'm just very lightly touching it to that table to shape it. It's also kind of really cooling it, the surface really fast by touching that steel. Steel is a fairly poor conductor of heat. so. You know, we can roll this across this marver most of the day without it really heating up the steel, um, but the steel will continue to cool the glass down with every touch. So I trapped the air in there again, got my bubble kind of popping up there, and so that's our starter bubble there. So it's going to do a quick shape and maybe give it a little bit more air. So the, the main difference when we get to this wood mold part of this, the main difference between the mold that we're using and the one that they use at Pizzola for the Alto vases is we have a turn mold. So I'm gonna continue rotating when I go into that mold. And we're able to do that because it's a symmetrical form of the carafe, you know, it, um, it's, equal on all sides and we're able to just in two parts be able to blow that and keep it rotating. Whereas the alto bases with that organic shape, they would not be able to continue rotating that because there's no way that that would continue turning in that mold. So I can feel myself hurrying whenever we start to do production you know, you're kind of 
working a bit more on like a, how many units per hour are you making? And uh, you're trying to think about efficiencies and all that. So it's, it's kind of a switch mindset switch a little bit for us when we start doing production compared to doing our more artistic glass. So my goal is to kind of get this shaped up and maintain a lot of this heat that I have from the furnace. I got it. So at this point, I'm going to take it and I'm going to hook my hose up. You can get a little air in here. Can you slide that mouthpiece back on me? Yep. Thank you. So just a quick touch again. I'm going to marvel it real quick, just touching that end. I'm going to start to get some of my length here before coming over to that mold the next time. So you can see I have it really moving. All right, Chris, I need that stool. So. You want to turn it so they can see a little better, Chris? Ready? Okay. So just like that, we have our shape. So much faster, you know, compared to all the time we put into shaping up that other vessel. Uh, this all happens fairly quickly. And so Chris, I'll take a little bit that we'll put on for that front there. Uh, just a second. I'll take a flash of heat. Um, nope. So I'm just trying to keep this thing a little bit warm, and we got one more little decorative addition that we put on here. Straight up and down now. And that's just our logo for these particular carafes. And then like most, or like a lot of production glass uh, that is mouth blown or hand blown, um, the rest of the finishing process will happen when it's you know not in the heat. So we will just get ready to knock this off, put it into the kiln, and then the glass will actually go through a process we call hot popping, where we'll introduce a torch to where we want it to break the top. We'll score it and kind of use a flame to fire polish that, what we call, and it finishes very nicely. I'll show you the, the actual one that we have finished as soon as I knock this one off. Are you ready, Chris? Throw a couple drops of water again. 
right? A little tap, and that will go into the kiln as well. Okay, so while it's not completely finished yet, it has a little bit of uh, man hours ago, most of the work in with the hot glass is all done. So here's uh, one of the finished carafes that we do. This one uh, has gold leaf on that stamp. So we kind of shows up a little bit better uh, on the clear glass, but we pair this with uh, either a few like uh, water glasses, or we also pair it with um, some kind of smaller flutes that we kind of call mimosa glasses. Essentially. So I think that is it for the demonstration. Um, are we going to take questions now? All right. Well, yes. I'm, yeah. I'm ready. Thank you, Jason and Chris. That was amazing. I have to admit, I wasn't sure how the round vessel was going to turn into a flat platter, and it was so exciting watching that happen. Um, so our first question is for Rebecca, and it's about Tiffany in the collection. And um, one of our participants is curious if the Kaufmans were um, collecting Tiffany during the period of 1900 to 1910, or so, or did they buy them later on in the 1930s with the era of the house? Um, in that, in which case, were they vintage when they bought them, or did they carry them in their department store? That's a very good question. So, to start, our um, museum collection has very little documentation about where these objects were purchased and why, because. Um, of course, when they were acquiring these objects, they weren't thinking about the fact that it would end up in the museum. So they didn't keep receipts for a lot of stuff. We don't have a lot of information in our archive about individual purchases. But I do know that Tiffany was really falling out of style after World War I. Um, it was almost like Wright's career, where he had a 10-year period where um, he just sort of fell out of fashion. He wasn't popular. And the same thing happened with Tiffany. And it wasn't until um, sort of the late 1930s and early 40s that he started to pick up a little bit of steam with, you know, peaking again in the 1960s with people making reproductions um, after Tiffany. But Edgar Jr. was really a leading force in bringing Tiffany back into style. He did work at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, and he was very in influential in, in the art world. So we do know that he played a large part in um, bringing them back to fashion. We don't know for sure when he acquired the pieces, but in all likelihood, it was in that 30s and 40s time period. So at that point, they would have been vintage to them, to the Kaufmans. Um, but they all, all of our Tiffany pieces are original um, Tiffany Studios pieces from, um, again, about 1900 up until the 1930s, late 1930s, um, they were producing with Tiffany, I think, um, passed in 1933. So Kind of a mixed bag answer, but yes, likely uh, purchased later um, when the revival started to happen. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, my next question is for um, Jason and Valerie, Jason and or Valerie, I guess. Um, there's a question about the finished piece, what it will look like. Um, can you talk about how this, uh, the, our viewers can see the finished piece? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Am I on now? Okay. Um, so the finished piece, since this was a one of a kind of a one of a kind thing that we were doing, kind of inspired by the collection of falling water, we don't have that exact object that you know we've made. It's not part of our production line or anything like that, so we can't tell you exactly how it looks. Um, it will definitely the when we put things away, especially things on that blue green purple scale will kind of glow a little bit redder. So it is harder to tell the true colors of something going into the kiln uh, as opposed to when it comes out tomorrow. But I do think that we will be following up with a, a, a good photograph of the object uh, so you can actually see what you 
uh, you know, saw in the process today, see it uh, in its true colors when it comes down, um, you know, in the next week, I don't think that would probably get to you in much. Great, wonderful. Um, there's a question about the type of glass that you use at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. The question is, is the glass that was blown basic soda lime glass or some other composition? Does the shop mix their own glass? That's a good question. So um, this is kind of more into the chemistry, but it is a, a soda lime glass that we use. Um, we do not make our own glass here. It's a fairly uh, messy and uh, a lot of dust uh, to make what we call batch, which is what we buy our form. So we get glass to us and the raw, the raw chemicals are together. Um, the materials are all in like a brown paper bag that we throw in there. And it's almost like a flower looking consistency. So it uh, looks nothing like glass. And then at 2300, it goes through that kind of chemical change. Uh, and then we're left with kind of a, know a large pot of, of clear glass um, more specifically our glass that we use here uh, is kind of specially formulated for workability uh, like a bottle glass that you would you know that they would uh, be made for a production line of glass bottles for beer or wine or anything they want that glass to freeze up much faster than what we would want our glass to work with. You know, I was talking about at certain points how we have a very limited window to work with the glass. Well, if it was a bottle glass, uh, it would be, um, you know, even half the time that we have to work with our glass because that glass is made to be blown into a mold and then freeze up so that the next object can be blown into that mold again. Like, every second that that glass stays hot longer than it needs to is kind of a lost opportunity for another one to be going into that mold. So very different kind of uh, uses for the glass, but very similar type of structure to the, the breakdown of materials. We might, ours uses a few more fluxes for work workability and clarity as well. Great, thank you, Jason. I think we have time for one more question and this one is for Jason. What are the panels that you were using made out of to shape the glass? The paddles? Oh, the, the paddles. paddles that we were using uh, are made out of cherry wood. So we typically use for the paddles, a cherry wood uh, for these blocks. I don't know that I really even touched on these much, but these are uh, also carved out of wood. We keep them wet. Uh, the whole time so that the, the glass doesn't burn through them quickly they're kind of expensive so um but usually it's fruit woods that we use um they have a tight grain so they don't burn up quite as fast and they hold moisture well so um whereas these cherry wood uh we use mostly use them dry and they won't stick to the glass or burn really fast uh the wet ones uh, the glass actually will ride on a layer of steam that's actually being created from the moisture in the wood. So as long as we keep it wet and don't stay on there too long with the glass, then we, we should get a lot of life out of these uh, blocks. Here. Good question. Great. Well, I wanted to thank our friends at the Pittsburgh Glass Center and Rebecca for presenting today. And thanks to all of you for joining. As we mentioned, we will follow up with an email to everyone on this webinar so that you can see the finished piece. I know there's a lot of questions about the color. So you'll be able to see the actual color of the real piece and it will also be available uh, by auction through the email um, and our proceeds will benefit the Pittsburgh Glass Center and Falling Water. Um, thank you everyone.